So when I first uh, came up with the title for this conference, I decided to present on using the Ostel ISQ instrument for making everyday clinical decisions involving dental implants. What I hope to impart on you today is it's all well and good to see mean values and things like that, but when you're in private practice and you have a patient in front of you, it doesn't matter if 99% of the patients have success if they're in the 1% failure group. It's hard to explain that. The other nice thing that I like about ISQ, and I will explain in a few moments, is that I'm no longer the bad guy about when implants get loaded. So I decided to change my title to be a little bit more jazzy and get your attention since I'm the third to go. Ostel use in practice. I want to know if you are true believers like me or are you still agnostics? Or am I going to have to convince you as to why this is important in clinical private practice? I'd like to thank Ostel primarily because they gave me a chance to visit with my aunt on the way over here. And this is always a great opportunity when I can stop by and see Aunt Elizabeth on the way into any meetings. Placing implants and restoring them in clinical practice, getting back to the movie concept and Top Gun, is kind of like this film that Ice Cube was in, Are We There Yet? And I think you can all relate to this if you have young children and you set out on a journey in a car. It's no different than having a patient and placing an implant. From the time you put that implant in, the questioning begins, are we there yet? Are you going to load this implant? Are you going to load this implant? And as a private practitioner, you are constantly the bad guy because you are the gatekeeper. You have to tell them no. Well, this is a great tool because now no longer am I the bad guy. It's the instrument and it's the patient as to why things don't work sooner. So now when the patient says, are we there yet? I say, well, the ISQ value says, no, you're not. You have to heal longer. And really this dates back to a case I treated on early on with a um, active surface or an enhanced surface. When I first got these implants, I was told by the company that in four weeks you could place a, a, an abutment and torque it to 36, 35 Newton centimeters. Well, the problem we find in practice is that the Patients don't seem to read the, the, journal, the, the books that are handed to us as clinicians. They don't seem to follow directions the way they're supposed to always biologically heal. And this woman received a single tooth implant in a healed site that was not grafted. And she was constantly, because of work, et cetera, wondering when we could load and pr this implant. Well, we know all about the dip period. And according to this enhanced surface by four weeks, Everything should be hunky-dory and we should be able to load this implant. That was not the case. Though I did achieve a final outcome, I had a major problem that occurred in this case. And this was the, the path that took me down the road to using ISQ. At four weeks, I started to torque the abutment on. And being that it was a Morse taper, it started to engage at about 28, but the implant started spinning. I had a real dilemma because I can't get the abutment off at this point, and here's a patient who I don't want to necessarily provisionalize and hasn't read the manual. She's not going to be able to be provisionalized at four weeks. She was able to be provisionalized at seven to eight weeks, and the abutment finally placed. But unfortunately for me, I had to live with a lot of dyspepsia, a lot of anguish, and a lot of Pepto-Bismol over the next couple of weeks. Because, as Vernon Sanders Law said, experience is a very hard teacher because in the real world, she gives you the test first and the lesson afterwards, unlike in academia where you learn all your lessons first and then you take your examinations later. So this is quite the opposite to the 65-year-old osteopenic patient who, with an enhanced surface implant, an SL active implant, I was able to immediately extract this tooth a little bit different from than before, place the implant, and instead of just knowing the insertion torque being 35, I also knew that she had an ISQ value of 8083. And so subsequently, after placing a healing abutment, grafting it, and suturing it, I could go back at two weeks because this is an, or four weeks, excuse me, and look and see objectively how well healed this implant is because I'm not going to reverse torque this implant. So at four weeks, we put the, uh, butt, the smart peg on, and we see we're at 8183 versus initial 8083. I know I can proceed with confidence to complete this case with my restorative dentist, and that's what they want to know. They, 
dentists and pa patients want to have predictability. They don't want to see failure. They want to enhance the likelihood of success. So this case was finished up, and I didn't have the same anguish that I did before. So the question I put out there to you today is how are you determining when you load your dental implants? Because number one, if you're the surgeon or if you're a restorative dentist and you're waiting for the surgeon to tell you if it's okay, how are they determining it? What are they objectively doing to determine it's okay? If you're waiting and determining it based upon what the company tells you that osteo integration would have occurred, well, doesn't necessarily account for extenuating circumstances such as if it was an immediately placed implant, if the site was grafted, if the patient had a variability to healing, etc. So not all sites are the same. How about based on past data? The problem is a lot of our past data is machine surface data and there's no correlation between our roughened surface and our enhanced surface implants of today and our past machine surfaces. Last but not least, the reverse torque, that dreaded test. Well, how many of you are willing to risk failing an implant to prove that it may succeed? I think it's utter utterly daffy to try to put it, an implant through a test that has very little correlation to occlusion. So, are you just guessing at implants healing or are you doing things objectively today? Because if you're not doing them objectively through data, then you're truly doing your patient and yourself a disservice. So when do you load? Well, let's get some objective quantitative data to do that. And the ISQs through the Ostel machine certainly are the best method of doing that today. Again, reverse torque, versus smart peg technology, I would lateral, I'd rather see resistance to lateral movements than to screw movements, which shear forces which have very little to do with occlusion. The nice thing that we know about this machine and this data is that it's scientifically proven. There's some good literature that supports it. First, the one thing that I like about the first study by Carl and colleagues is that there are it shows a variability and a sensitivity to the specific anatomic site. As Jay and uh, 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 alluded to, that different implant systems, according to Al Nawas and colleagues, have different footprints. So you can't take BioHorizons data and necessarily put it to Strauman data, to NAOS data, to Noble BioCare data. Each implant system has its own footprint. Certainly, if you have values anywhere from 57 to 82, you know you have, you're going to be successful based on Bellary's past data. And certainly, 70 or better, as Danny pointed out, is considered very high stability and you can proceed with confidence. The strength of this is not one-point data, but looking at two points in case there are such things as the dip, et cetera, that might occur. And last but not least, we know that the current rendition of this system is been validated by Valderrama and colleagues out at the University of Texas San Antonio. So even though we are no longer hooking the machine up through a cord, we know that the wireless works just as effectively. So where do I need Ostel in my practice just in the last week alone? Here are several examples. I had an 84-year-old patient with an immediate implant placement. 84-year-olds don't have forever to heal. They want to know when they can get done as soon as possible. How about the immediate load case? How long are you, we going to make them wait? What about the type 1 diabetic? We know that diabetics, based on the dowel data with type 2, can heal well. But what about the type 1 data, diabetic? How long are you going to wait for them to heal? And last but not least, how about the patient where a prior implant had failed? How long are you going to wait the second time around? The cases that I plan to share with you today are going to be an immediate implant placement case that I had recently. Patients with special circumstances which seem to be coming greater and greater. Patients where bone quality confounds our ability to predict. Patients where we quote unquote push the envelope. Patients with compromised health. So these are people who I see day in and day out in my practice and I'm sure it's not so dissimilar to yours. How about the extraction, the immediate implant placement case? Well, here's one where I used a bimodal implant in this 
failed tooth number nine maxillary central incisor. And I happen to be a big lover of immediate placements. That's another whole discussion, but this is the way I do them in my world up in Yardley, PA, and I've had a pretty good run of it. So I extracted the tooth, debrided the area, placed this bimodal surface implant in this 67, 68-year-old African-American female who had an unremarkable medical history. So upon placement, I had an RFA value of 61.59 and 30 newton centimeters insertion torque. Not quite where we would want to provisionalize a case such as this. But what's interesting it happens over the next couple of weeks and months where we've grafted this, used a double layer of collagen membrane, sutured the flap back. If I just had insertion torque, I might be lost in a case like this. Because when I go back in one month, certainly the soft tissue healing looks great. But look at our RFA, our ISQ value. It's dropped to 5043. And the question is, is this a failing implant? Is this an implant going through a dip phase? What do we do in this situation? Well, we tell the patient certainly we can't proceed and we have maybe some issues to be concerned with. Here's two months. Tissue looks great, but upon RFA value, we're at 5240. We look at three months, 4860. The question is, is this patient ever going to get out of the woods, or are we going to have a failing implant to deal with? At five months, 5960. Now, this patient isn't a 70, but what's wrong with the 5960? This is the anterior maxilla, not the posterior mandible. Well, she's been restored after five months of healing. And look at the bone stability at one year and the soft tissue at one year. Why was RFA so beneficial? First, the medical history would not have suggested that this given patient would have taken this long to heal. Don't tell me about all the mean values. I have to deal with this lady at this time point, and I need to give her some objective hard facts as to why we proceed or we wait. If I would have reverse torqued this at eight weeks and I didn't have RFA, what do you think would have happened? Never mind cement loss, RFA, this would have, this would have been a reverse torque failure for sure. Would most of us have waited five months for this to heal? Because the soft tissue looked great and radiographically the case looked great at two and three months. We, I was benefited by a machine that gave me objective information. Well, I don't know about the rest of you, but I keep getting all these patients in my practice who have special circumstances, and it's becoming greater and greater in number. So what about the extremely busy patient who's constantly traveling? Well, enhanced surface technologies such as um, electro-wetted surfaces or SL Active are certainly redefining the way we go about implant dentistry because we've always had to worry about the dip, and I'm going to throw out something today that I think is rather intriguing. Historically, we've looked at implants, and even with the SL Active, we've talked about shortening the dip from four weeks' time down to two weeks' time, such that at four weeks we have a stable implant to provisionalize and load, or even at three weeks. With more recent evidence in animal data, we're seeing with some of these surfaces, such as the electrowetted, that maybe no dip exists at least on a histologic level with animals. And that relates to the wettability of these surfaces because of how clean they are and the ability to grab the clot and have more distant and contact osseointegration occur at a faster rate. Enhanced wettability. We're getting to the point where implant companies are kind of like Nike versus Reebok, saying my quick is quicker than your quick. And how quick is quick? So here's a, this patient who is constantly traveling, 53-year-old uh, who's in the computer industry, constantly traveling outside the United States who has a recurrent abscess on a primary tooth. We extract it, and in the area, we placed a little bit of a collagen sponge, allowed it to heal. Well, at about three months, 
We do some measurements, and unfortunately, he has an impacted prime, uh, uh, permanent canine, which confounds our abilities to necessarily place an ideally length implant. We can talk about 10 millimeters, 12, 13, whatever. This is a patient where I need a shorter implant, and I need something objective to tell me when I can provisionalize him, because he's in and out of the country all the time. So here, I did a minimal flap elevation place the implant. I was not going to do this as an immediate case. Insertion torque was great, 32 newton centimeters, 60, 76 ISQ. The 60 is in a buccal lingual, 76 mesial distal. Place our healing abutment, allow them to go away sutured with a absorbable uh, gut suture, and at two weeks, we're going to see them. Thank goodness we're a little short of the Canine. I know there's some recent evidence in, in the International Journal of Periodontics and Restorative Dentistry where people are placing implants through teeth. I'm a low-risk guy. I want to keep my life simple. So I try to avoid problems. So here at two weeks, we look at this implant, and lo and behold, when we look at RFA, not only do we see stability, but a significant increase, 7376 versus 6076. This I call today the bump. We're no longer looking at dips, but we're looking at bumps. And at least in my practice recently, where I've retrospectively looked at the first 80 patients or so, that I've looked at this phenomenon, and I'm calling the dip a change of plus or minus three OSTEL units based upon what I have learned is plus or minus two is the accuracy of the instrument. What we see is the di ratio of dips to bumps is close to five to one. Dips are almost non-existent. Most all of these implants placed with an electro-wetted surfaced implant are either stable or seeing increases. The real limiting factor in implant dentistry today is not necessarily bone healing, but soft tissue healing more than anything. So RFA is giving us information that we never thought possible in the past where we felt that we'd have to go through this dip period. Now we're seeing stability or bump period healing. And this may change the way we do implant dentistry in the near and distant future. What we see is at four weeks that this bump has remained pretty stable and it's at 72.74 versus the initial 60.76. The implant has been completed, patient is happy, and he can travel and not have to worry about this area anymore. Pre-treatment to completed case. And this is at about six to nine months post-treatment. What about the patient with type three to four bone quality and when to load? Here's a case where I extracted a tooth. He's an executive for a, a pharmaceutical concern. When I place this, this is a one-shot implant. I say that because I placed it such that there's no way I can go back and thread the needle like this again. The problem is that when I got the uh, insert torque, the insert torque was hand tightening only, but an ISQ of 6060 in type 3 to 4 bone, which made me want to leave this implant. If it would have just been hand tightening, I would have felt very uncomfortable, but the ISQ gave me a dimension that I didn't have before. So I placed the abutment on this implant, allowed it to heal, and you can see very little room for error here. And the question, did I make the right call? I wouldn't want to reverse torque this. I would want to use ISQ values to determine it. And so capriciously, I took a six-week wake period, took the readings, and it was 70-70. And I knew we could provisionalize this case because the guy hated par the partial denture he was wearing. So we provisionalized it at that time. Subsequently, at two years now, we have a completed case that's been very stable. What about the patient where we push the envelope, such as this, where the patient is unable to afford a sinus elevation in my practice? He cannot afford a sinus lift, nor does he want to go through with it. So in a situation such as this, when we extract the tooth, I was able to immediately place in the distal site. And the problem was I had an insertion torque of 15 newton centimeters and an ISQ of 49.53 which is not making me feel very comfortable. But I, had, I felt reasonably good stability. 
And what I did here was I submerged this implant after grafting it and arbitrarily I gave four months worth of healing. I didn't, even though this was an SL active surface, how do I know how long it's going to take? But it was pretty low stability quotient. There's been no data to really tell me when to proceed. Long and short, I uncovered this. But rather than reverse torque this implant and potentially lose it, I had an ISQ value of 7470 versus 4953. Very comfortable to complete this case at this time. You can see good bone stability. He had no posterior teeth beyond this, so doing a cantilever was what this uh, dentist decided to do. Final restoration at about one year post-treatment. What about the medically compromised patient? Like many of you, all of my diabetic patients who have type 2 always come in and tell me how well controlled they are. Well, that's well and good, but I need to have something objective to determine how well healed they are before I feel comfortable with proceeding on their care. So again, I happen to be a big immediate placement of implant person, so in this situation I extracted the tooth, placed the implant immediately, got my RFA value, very high, 82.74 with an ISQ of 35. grafted the area with an allograft with platelet-derived growth factor and used a amnion chorion membrane over this area. After suturing it, I allowed it to heal. And the question is, when do you go forward? Well, it had pretty high insert um, stability and it also had good RFA value. So at six weeks, I decided arbitrarily to look at this implant and noted slight drop from original, but nonetheless very high stability values such that I felt very comfortable proceeding or having the, the uh, torquing the abutment on at that time and having the dentist ref restore the case, which we subsequently do. You can see the abutment when I torqued it on at 35. Final restoration. Nowadays with the co cost of gold, I would say this is very pricey to say the least. Completed case. Certainly objective qualitative data give me, gave us confidence to proceed forward. At this time, I know that the hour grows late. I'd like to thank those individuals who happen to do the restorative dentistry in these cases. They're the ones who make me good, look good because certainly no one looks at the basement of a house and says that you've done a magnificent job building it. It's always the facade and the gingerbread trimmings that make it look good and these people certainly make me good look good as a surgeon and I'd like to just summarize with the following that RFA is an invaluable tool with well-documented research evidence to warrant its inclusion in your armamentarium to me it's every bit as important as the drill that I use in my practice to place the implant secondly the information gained from Ostel readings enables us to make objective decisions on implant healing and loading and that's important when you're dealing with the individual patient not with the average means of patients in general practice the patient wants to know what are you doing for me not what are you doing for them and last but not least Further elucidation really needs to be made on whether values obtained should be used as absolutes or relative to the treated site. For example, is a 60 in the anterior maxilla the same as a 60 in the second molar area of the posterior mandible? Is it the same in a healed site versus a gra grafted site? These are things that hopefully the site that Jan Gottlow is dealing with and the, our information obtained from academia will bear out. So. I'd very much like to thank you for giving me your time, and I look forward to getting back to the States. The Yankees are up 2-0 in their series against Minnesota, and this, this is my uh, family, and my passion happens to be baseball when I'm not looking at dental implants. Thank you very much.